friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is great to look out and see you here this morning. Welcome. If you are our guest today, we're just thrilled you're here. We're so glad that God has called you into His house to join with us in worship. And so uh, just know that uh, your presence means a lot to us. And so again, thanks for being here. If you'd like to um, know more about Crestview or uh, talk with me about becoming more involved, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Uh, We'll have another class for interested people who are thinking about maybe uh, becoming a part of this church in the next month or so, and uh, so you'll be hearing more about that. But again, glad you're here. A couple of announcements. First of all, welcome to those of you who are with us online as well. Uh, It is the first Sunday of the month, and so each uh, month we celebrate communion on the first Sunday of the month, as you can see. And uh, if you have not yet gotten your elements, they're out in the uh, narthex. If you raise your hand, I bet somebody will help you out. But uh, I want you to know that um, on behalf of this church, just to say this is not Crestview's table, it's not a Presbyterian table, it's the Lord's table for the Lord's people. And so we invite all of you to celebrate the sacrament with us uh, later during the service. Some stuff going on today I want to share with you, okay? Uh, First of all, uh, you might have seen next door we have a a conference of Bhutanese Christians. So uh, every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock we have the Cincinnati Assembly which is a Bhutanese Christian fellowship from the region, uh, worshiping in our chapel. And this is the second year in a row that they have hosted their annual meeting here at Crestview. There are over 125 folks from Bhutan next door. So here's a prize. Can anyone tell me where Bhutan is located on the map? Yeah? If you get the answer right, you get to move to the front pew. So anyway, you see, <laughs> that's, the, that's the prize. So no, think, uh, think China and India, and Bhutan's right there near Nepal. So uh, I was told yesterday when I was meeting with them that this is the largest gathering of Bhutanese Christians outside of the country of Bhutan in the world. And so isn't that cool that uh, here they are in our midst? And so uh, it's a great partnership we have with them. Uh, speaking of uh, international uh, matters, we have uh, Paul Wig, who is a missionary we support, and Paul will be praying for you later. And Looking forward to uh, meeting you. He'll be out in the narthex after the service. Uh, Paul has been a partner of this church in India for many, many years. And so it's just great to have you uh, with us this morning. Um, What else do we have here? A check-in. If you have not uh, checked in before, you can uh, go to a text number and check in. Let us know you're here. If you have any prayer requests, we'd love to pray for you. So our staff uh, shares those requests. Uh, We have an intercessory prayer team. And so just let us know and we will certainly pray for you. One, uh, one uh, mention of the flooding in eastern Kentucky was made this past week, and we'll certainly pray for those folks as well. You see that there's an extra bud vase on the table. Uh, Brendan and Larry Harper have a new grandson, Atlas Henry Abel, and so congratulations to you. It's uh, such a pleasure to be able to celebrate that with you. All right, anything else? Rodney, anything else from you? You're good? All right. So this morning, as always, we're going to pray God's Word back to Him. And so we're going to meditate on Psalm 18, verse 2. I'll read through it twice. We'll meditate on God's Word, and then we will pray it to Him. So let's just quiet ourselves and be still and go to God in prayer. Let's let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank You for the gift of Your Son and the gift of Your Word. And we thank You that through Your psalmist You communicate these truths. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. Our gracious God, we thank You that You are steadfast in Your faithfulness and in Your love for us. And as we enter into this time of worship, we bring with us so many cares and so many concerns, but we know that even when the ground beneath our feet seems to be shifting, the tide seems to be turning and the wind is blowing, we have a rock in You. Lord, we thank You that You are our fortress, that You protect us, and through Your Son, Jesus Christ, You've delivered us from sin and from death. And so, Lord, we pray that during these moments we spend with each other and You, 
we will find refuge in your Son. And so prepare us now, Lord, for worship. And we pray that everything we say, think, and do will bless and glorify your holy name. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. When we were sinners, lost and hopeless, without purpose or value, you saved us. We did nothing to earn this salvation. It was only by your power and for your pleasure that you saved us. You crafted us into new creations, full of divine purpose and value. We have been transformed from death to life, for hopelessness to pur purposefulness, from ashes to beauty, and all by the power and prerogative of your grace. What can we do in response but to thank you for living in us and to seek with all our hearts to worship and live in you? Please stand for our song of praise, Come Thou Fount.
Thank you, Sarah and Rodney. Grace is the word for the day. So it was about uh, the early 1880s, and a man named George, young guy, about 20 years old, living in New York City, decided it is too hot in the city in the summer. And so he talked to his mother, Maria, and they decided, you know what, we need to go find some mountains where we can cool off. And so they began looking around the country, and they found some mountains, and they went for the summer, and they loved it there. And so the next summer, George went back again, and he just loved those mountains. And George was from a family that had some means, and eventually he decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy some property, and I'm going to build my dream mountain house. And so he began looking around in the area, and he found some property, and he purchased 125,000 acres. And he found an architect, and they began to work on his mountain house, his little summer home he was going to build. And eventually, they came up with a plan, and the architect went out and he hired 1,000 construction workers to build a house that would be 178,000 square feet. The house would have 43 bathrooms, 36 guest bedrooms, have a dining room that seated comfortably 64 people around one table. And so clearly George, in his early 20s, was not just building this house for himself. He had other people in mind. And so over time, the house was constructed, 1889 to 1896, and finally he was able to move in, and he began to entertain people in that house. Can anybody guess the name of the house? Are you following me? The Biltmore Estate, that's right. My wife and I went to the Biltmore Estate once, and I have a couple of memories about going to the Biltmore Estate. First of all, it was $100 per person to walk through. And when we got done walking through, I looked at my watch and said, that was $2 per minute for you and me to see this house. <laughs> we let people come through our house for free all the time. We feed them even at our house. But there were some other things that I concluded. One of my main thoughts was that when Vanderbilt built this masterpiece, he didn't just build it for himself. He built it to entertain and bless other people. He built it for other people to enjoy. Part of the story I thought was interesting was that uh, Vanderbilt eventually started to date a woman. Her name was Edith. And uh, they were getting to know one another, and he invited her down to see his summer home. In fact, here's what it looks like. Can you imagine if you're Edith, and you pull around the corner, and he says, oh yeah, by the way, here's my summer home. She's thinking, he's a keeper. I mean, I'm hanging on to this guy, right? But isn't that an interesting story that they're in the mountains near Asheville, North Carolina. He built this massive 178,000 square foot estate as a masterpiece for others. And that's where I want to go with you today. So as you know, we're working through a series we're calling it Justified, looking at different aspects of what it means to be justified, made right with God through Jesus Christ. And so today what we're looking at is how God moves us from death to life when we are justified. And basically, our sermon is going to move like this. We're going to begin by looking at who we are, our identity. Then we're going to look at what God has done for us, what God is doing in us, and what God wants to do through us. And so just keep that in mind. That's where we're going today. If you're here for the first time, what we do is we just open God's Word, 
and we just work our way through it. And so, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Here you go. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. There is so much here. This is like a three-hour sermon alone. Not today. But I mean, there's a lot here. So let's just go ahead and look at it. So Paul is writing to these Christians in Ephesus, and he begins by saying, as for you, So remember, when you and I look at the Bible, it is not written about us, it's written for us. And so this is a word for you and me, as for you. You know, you, that's our our name, is one of the sweetest sounds to our ears. We love the sound of our own name. We love things that are about us. I mean, that's just who we are as humans. In fact, if I were to take a picture of the sanctuary right now and post the picture up on the screen, who would be the first person you would look for? Yourself, right? We would all look for ourselves. We love the sound of our own name. We love thinking about ourselves. And so what he's doing here is he's saying, okay, here, as for you, here's your identity. This is who you are in the eyes of God. You were dead in your transgressions and in your sins. So much here. Isn't that interesting language that Paul would say you're dead in your sins? Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say that you were spiritually ignorant or you were spiritually weak or you were spiritually uninformed or you were spiritually unmotivated or you were spiritually distracted. He says you were spiritually dead. You see, if you and I are spiritually weak, we can make ourselves strong. If we are spiritually ignorant, we can make ourselves become more informed. If you and I are spiritually distracted, we can become focused. If we are spiritually unwilling or unmotivated, we can get inspired. But if we are spiritually dead, there is nothing we can do. I mean, I could ask right now for everyone in this room to raise his or her hand, and we could do that. If I walk down to our memorial garden down that hill, where dozens and dozens of our dear ones are buried, and said, everybody raise your hand, guess how many hands would be raised? None. Because dead people can't raise their hand. He is saying here that the spiritual condition that you and I have apart from Christ is a condition known as death. Aren't you glad you're here this morning? Isn't that good news? You got up on a Sunday morning? There's a guy in that window right there, the bottom left window, John Calvin, who said that it is called total depravity. On our own, there is nothing we can do to make ourselves spiritually alive and be reconciled to God because dead people can't do that. I don't want to hammer that point, but it's so basic to who we are and basic to our understanding. So when you think about your own life apart from Christ and think, well, there are ways I can get to God and please God and do God's will apart from Christ, you can't because dead people can't do that kind of thing. So that's how he begins. You were dead in what? Two words, transgressions and sins. I think it's interesting that Paul says it's not just one thing, it's two. And so transgress means to step across a line. God's drawn a line, and as human beings, we step across it. We all do over and over again. If you know or understand the game of basketball, when someone is standing at the free throw line, there is a line there. If he or she shoots the basketball and makes the shot but steps across the line, does the shot count? No. They have transgressed over that line. God says, because you are spiritually dead, you have transgressed. And then the other word is the word sin. And in in the Greek, it literally means to miss the mark. And so the image is of an archer shooting an arrow through a hoop. And if the archer misses the hoop and the arrow doesn't go through the hoop, that archer has sinned. So that's the image that Paul is giving us. We are spiritually dead because we always are stepping across the line and we are always missing the mark. It continues on, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And so the picture, the word follow can also be translated meander. Have you ever had that experience of, we're just kind of meandering through life? We're just kind of going through the flow. Yeah, the culture says do this, I'm going to do that. Man, I'll just do what, I'm going to go, I'm just going to get along, I'm going to go along, I'm just going to keep on bumping along. You know, the image of a fish in the water strikes a chord with me here. A fish that is dead can only go with the flow, right? But a fish that is alive can swim against it. Paul is saying, there was a time 
in our lives, before we encountered Christ, we're just meandering around, just kind of following the way of the world. And I know when I look in the mirror, I see Sean Barkley right there. I think it's true for all of us. And we also followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is another name for Satan, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So this adversary that God has is not passive. Do you see what he is? He's active and he's at work. And so I sometimes wonder, why can't I stop doing the things I don't want to do? You ever just think, why can't I, why can't I be better? Or why don't I start doing the things I know I'm supposed to do? You know, the reason we can't do that is because there's someone who is stronger than you and me at work in this world. And that's what Paul is seeing here. And so he sets up the situation with those Ephesian Christians. I want you to understand who you are. You think you've got all these different ways that you can please God and reach God and all these things you can do and different religious actions. And the truth is, you can't because dead people can't become alive. And then he continues on, the next screen, verses 4 and 5. And now, notice now it's no longer you. Paul's like, hey, by the way, it's all of us. This is a universal condition I am talking about. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, okay, we're, we're all in this together. Again, a universal condition. We were by nature objects of wrath. And so what he's saying is we can't repair ourselves spiritually. We can't can't eliminate our brokenness. You and I have broken parts of our lives we don't even realize or recognize. He's saying we have been objects of wrath. That is the world that we live in. That is who we are. We can't get to that goal. I've got a couple of friends of mine, Larry and Glenna. So Larry and Glenna, uh, a couple that uh, I knew when we lived in Louisville, great friend of mine, Larry is, one of my golfing partners, Glenna doesn't play golf. But Larry loves to play golf. And so one day, Glenna said, we need to spend some more time together. Can I go with you to play golf? Which is not a good idea. So so, so, can I go with you to play golf? And so she said, I don't want to play. I just want to sit in the cart and watch and observe. And so she gets in the cart and they're playing one of the first holes on the course and Larry hits the ball on the green on his second shot. It's a par four, but he three putts, so he makes a bogey. And he comes back to the cart, and Glenn says, wouldn't it have been easier had you hit the ball closer to the hole in the first place? That was the first and last time she ever rode in the golf cart with Larry. We can't hit the ball close to the hole, you all, because we are objects of, we are people who are spiritually dead. That's who we are. However, in the spiritual hopelessness, look at what Paul says God has done for us. So our identity, who we are, and now what God has done for us. Two of the most beautiful words in the entire Bible right here in front of us. But God, in spite of everything, in spite of the brokenness, in spite of the flaws, in spite of the mistakes, but God. God. He has intervened. And who is God? We talked about a really rich guy named George who is rich in mercy. God is not rich in anger. He is not rich in bitterness. He is not rich in vengeance. He's rich in mercy. Mercy is when God says, I know you deserve this, but you will not get that. He withholds any kind of punishment. He is rich in mercy. And he also loves us because of his great love for us. And here you go, He has made us alive with Christ. God has done this for us. You know, it's not about us, it's about Him. And so as I read these words, yes, I don't like the fact that we're spiritually dead. I love the fact that God is merciful in spite of it. And He is rich in His love for us as well. And when did He make us alive? When did He do that? When we started behaving ourselves? when we started attending church every Sunday, when we started doing good things all the time, we started giving 10% of our income away, is that when God decided He would make us alive? No, He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. You know, if, if I am talking with someone and they say, why are you a Christian? You just heard it. 
because I know that I am a broken and flawed human being, and on my own, I cannot have a relationship with the holy, pure God of the universe. It is only because He has made me alive in Christ. 101 Christianity today, but it's so vital for us to make sure we're square with us. So that's what He's done for us. And now, verses 6 and 7, we start to think what he, is, what he is doing in us. He has raised us with Christ and united us with Him. And God raised us up with Christ. Notice the past tense there. It's already happened. And so again, it's nothing that you and I have to work for and earn. God has already done it for you and me. He has raised us. We were dead spiritually. Not anymore. Because He has raised us with Christ as we sit right here. And seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. And when you read the word seated there, think about the word united. Inside of us, we have been united with Christ. So that when God looks at you and me now, He doesn't see all the brokenness and the flaws and all the mistakes we make. He sees Jesus Christ. Because we've been united with Him. And if you think about uh, married couples, spouses, and there is a union. When I officiate a wedding, uh, one of the things I say is the two have become one flesh now. They are, they are, they're one in many ways. And when you look at a, a married couple, uh, if one person or one spouse is going through a difficult time, guess what happens to the other spouse? It's hard on them too, because they're united. On Thursday night, we had uh, someone here, uh, Dan, who's one of our members, and he attends on Thursday evenings. And uh, Dan recently had his leg amputated, as many of you know. And I remember being in the hospital with Dan and his wife Donna ju- the, the evening before he was going to lose his leg. And we were talking about what that was going to be like and processing that. And as I looked at the two of them, I realized Dan's not the only one who has a sore leg right now. Donna is having the same pain in her leg because they're united. And so if one spouse embarrasses the other, I'm speaking personally here. So if one spouse embarrasses the other, which I have done from time to time in my life? Well, if one spouse does something that's embarrassing, the other's embarrassed is what I meant to say. You know, I'm just trying to say that we are united with Christ. That is what God is doing in us. In order that in the coming ages, He might show how awesome and wonderful you and I are, right? No. What's He going to show? He has done this for us, that He might show the incomparable riches, so He's rich in mercy. Now what's He rich in? Grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God has given us His grace. He's given us gifts that we do not deserve. You know, I think often, a lot of us, certainly myself included, complain about all the stuff I don't have. If God would just do that, or if I just had that, if I could just enjoy that, if I just possessed that, if I could just see that, and here's the truth, God has given us His grace. He has given us more than we can ever get for ourselves. And that's what he wants us to know here. We think about how difficult life is. And let me tell you, apart from his grace, it's even more difficult than it is today. And he expressed his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What is God's disposition toward you right now and toward me? When he looks at you and me, his disposition is kindness. I love you. I've given you my mercy. I've given you my grace. God is not angry, bitter, disappointed. He might grieve with us when we grieve. God has said, no, my disposition for you is that I am kind. He wants to show His power. And let me just say that for me, this makes me feel secure. What about you? To know that in spite of my flaws, in spite of my broken, he, we're, I'm secure in that. I mean, that's what God wants for our lives. You know, insecure people do really amazingly heinous things sometimes. In fact, I came across this interesting list, the habits of insecure people. See if this uh, resonates with any of you. The five have highly critical of others, often as, often a bully. When you and I find ourselves being highly critical, it's often because we're insecure. You look at some of the most notorious dictators in world history, highly insecure people. We chronically worry about the future. We rarely say no. Number four, I, I was confessing on Thursday something, sometimes my insecurity pops up. Ask for reassurance constantly. In fact, on Thursday I said, you know, sometimes I really struggle with this. And someone from the back of the room said, you're doing a great job, Sean. I was like, okay, I appreciate it. I need the reassurance. <laughs> I don't ask for amens, but you know, I think some pastors do for that reason, by the way. 
and communicate in a passive-aggressive manner. That's not what God wants for you and me. He wants for you and me to experience the fullness of His love and to have security in that. That's what He is doing in us. And then moving on, verses 8 and 9. We're getting there, y'all. If you could memorize a verse of Scripture, here's a good one. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. How am I saved? God's grace that I receive through faith is how I experience God's salvation. And it's not from yourselves. Again, Paul wants to make sure that there is no spiritual boasting because it is the gift of God. Therefore, no one can boast. Have you ever been in a situation where you've done something and someone else has taken credit for, you, for doing that? How does that feel? It feels terrible, doesn't it? If, if, if you do something or I do something and someone takes credit for that when it's our work, well, that feels awful. That's what Paul's saying here. We can't take credit for God's work. A few summers ago, um, let's see, it was probably the summer, we moved here in 16, maybe the summer of 15, uh, Davis was home for the summer from UK, and we were living down in Charlotte, we had a great bookstore we loved to, to go to, and we decided we were going to buy uh, Malcolm Gladwell books, and so we bought David and Goliath, Outliers, and Tipping Point, Point. and so the three of us just passed those books around the family for the summer. And I, I loved reading the book Tipping Point, because it's just things I'm interested in, sociology and, and the like. And I loved it, enjoyed that book. And it wasn't a month later that I read where actually Malcolm Gladwell had plagiarized a lot of that book. He hadn't cited the work of a sociologist who had done all that research and all that work. Imagine how that sociologist felt about Gladwell who sold 1.8 million copies of that book. He's using my work. Think of that image. So when you and I start to feel like kind of proud and puffed up spiritually, you know, look, look at how good I am, and too bad you're not as spiritual as I am, remember, we can't boast. He's done it for us. In fact, no wonder, frequently in God's Word, He says, I oppose the proud. All right. One last thing. What's He going to do through us? Verse 10. We've done this before, but let's do it again. He concludes with this. For we are God's workmanship. And the word workmanship can also be translated masterpiece. Think George Vanderbilt. We are God's masterpiece. The Greek word is the word poema. P-O-E-M-A. When you hear the word poema and think about how it's spelled, what comes to your mind? Poem, right? Paul is saying we are God's poetry. God's handiwork. God's masterpiece. God's workmanship. And why did He create you and me as His workmanship and His masterpiece? Well, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We have been created to bless other people. Again, you think about 178,000 square feet and 35 guest bedrooms and 43 bathrooms and 64 people at the table. It was built to bless others. It was a masterpiece. You look in the mirror and I look in the mirror and we say, I might not look or feel like a masterpiece today, but that's who I am. God has made me to be that blessing. And here's a beautiful thing. He prepared in advance those good works for us to do. And so as you and I think about our lives and we depart from this place, understand that God has already designed something for us. And our task is those who believe and walk with Him is to to discover that and to be that workmanship. Well, as you know, none of this happened without the cross. And so I'd like to invite you now to go ahead and get your communion elements if you're at home. You see, it is by the cross that we are made alive with Christ through His death and resurrection. And again, just remember this is a table for all of us. And so I invite you to share the meal. But you remember the story that Jesus was with His disciples and they're celebrating the Passover feast. We talked about that earlier this summer. So they're celebrating the Passover feast. And it's during that meal, that common meal, where they're going through the, the same ceremony they've gone through for years and years and years. Jesus says, there's a new covenant now. This meal now has new meaning. And so He's got these common elements of the bread and the wine. And so after he says that, he says to his disciples, this is my body, it's broken for you, take and eat, and when you do this, remember me. And they're trying to process that. And then he continues on, saying, this cup 
is the new covenant, sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins, all of you drink of it. For often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. And so friends, these are God's gifts for you and me. He has made us alive in Christ. So I'd like to invite you now to go ahead and take the cup and the bread together. As we go to God in prayer, I'm wondering if I... Paul, could I invite you to come join me here? You're welcome to bring your daughter as well if she'd like. But you want to come? No, it's okay. Um, as we uh, prepare to conclude our service, this is Paul Wig. How many years have you been a, a missionary in India? About 32. 32 years missionary in India. And uh, it's, our, it's our joy and pleasure to support you. And what I'd like to do is ask if we could pray for you now. Let's all pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you that you've given us this day and this opportunity to, to be together in your house with glad and cheerful hearts. And we thank you for the work you have done for us in your Son. And thinking about the fact that we are your workmanship, we thank you for Paul and his family. For 32 years of laboring in India, doing your work, spreading your word, being agents of reconciliation and of hope and of faith. We thank you for the many, many people who have come to know you through the wigs. And Lord, we pray that you will give him more good years. We pray for their safety. We pray for their well-being. Lord, we pray that you'll continue to energize them and support them and guide them. And so we pray that whatever we can do in this space today, you'll show us how we can also support them as well. And so thank you for them, for their faithfulness. And Lord, we also know that you understand the needs of our hearts and the cares that we have right now as well as the joys. And we lift them to you, one and all, in the strong name of Jesus Christ. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together for the Lord's Prayer. Thank you so much. Yeah.
again, welcome and thank you for being here. You're invited across the hall to what we call gathering grounds for some coffee and some donut holes. They're delicious. I had three already this morning. Rodney, I'm ahead of you by two at least probably. And also uh, the Wigs. Get a chance to meet Paul. He'll be out in the narthex as well. So friends, go in peace and have courage and do that which is right and return no one evil for evil, but in all things rejoice in the power and the presence of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.